I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Mark Zarin. I'm here from VMware. I work out of our Cambridge office near Boston. And today I'm going to be talking about strings. So the talk is divided into four parts. The first part talks about the inspiration for the talk, some of the ideas that got me started down this path. The next part integrates a bunch of experience that I've had working with strings over the last decade at VMware. And the third part tries to distill some of those pieces together into a more structured format. And the fourth part takes a brief look at some code I've been working on in this, to take advantage of these thoughts or to explore these thoughts. So the first piece of inspiration is this, which is that the copy on write strings in GCC before GCC5 are going away. We all know that. I call this the cow is dead. That's the uh, first inspiration. Uh, and so just to review, a copy on write string is a string whose instance contains just a pointer. That pointer, not surprisingly, is to a null terminated string on the heap. But there's a control block that's ahead of the string itself that includes a rough count, length, and capacity. And that allows multiple string instances to share the same heap block. Of course, when you need to mutate the string, you have to break the sharing um, and adjust the rough counts, et cetera. So what's, taking, what's replacing copy on write strings? Well, I should mention the reason copy on write strings are going away is that operations that should not invalidate iterators do invalidate iterators with copy on write strings. So they're no longer le legal in C11, though they're still there in GCC. Um, and I still use them in a lot of my code, or VMware, my, my, the code that I work on in VMware. The, the next thing that's coming is small string optimization, which is in all of the compilers now, and that's definitely here to stay. But just to review, this again has a pointer to a heap block with an terminated string, and the trick, of course, is that you can jam the string data into the member, the instance member data. For people who can't read hex, that says the same thing. Um, and however, there is some cost potentially in dropping the sharing. There's also potentially some uh, speed up in, in dropping the sharing, gaining locality. But I took, uh, I used GCC's ability to switch between these two modes in one of our uh, workloads. And what I found was an eight an eight, over 8% 8 increase in the average heap block size. This makes a lot of sense because all the string instances that were in member data everywhere in the heap, they went from one pointer to a bunch of pointers. So all the heap block, many of the heap blocks got bigger. Um, this actually, and I also saw a 12% increase in the number of heap blocks. This also makes sense because we drop sharing. So now the same string is represented in lots of, lots of places repeated in the heap. And the actual overall effect is pretty dramatic. It's a 20% increase in the actual used bytes in the heap. Question. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, you're doing this on a 64-bit system or 32? Uh, yes, 64-bit. Okay, interesting, because with 64-bit systems, you know, the number of, of strings that don't allocate any memory at all should be pretty su substantial in terms of you know, up to like 20 odd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, well, first of all, I want to, I got these numbers, I want to make a plug. Mm -hmm. I got these numbers using my colleague uh, Tim Buddy's tool, CHAP, and he's giving a talk on that on Saturday, so mm -hmm. it's great for, like, looking at what's in your heap, mm -hmm. especially if you want to know how your heap is being used right now. Um, but there are a couple of caveats, and, and this is, I think, some of the things that Marshall's thinking about. Um, one is that there's probably a bunch of other stuff going on with this compiler switch, switching between the ABIs. So the strings are only a component of this is increase, and I haven't analyzed it. My gut is that they're the vast majority of the increase. Um, also, it could be that we made this giant performance uh, gain, and we traded a bunch of space for a huge performance leap. Um, the rig that I was testing this on was not a good rig for actually measuring performance of this particular workload, so I don't have those numbers. Um, and actually, this workload is most of the time uh, heap constrained, not CPU constrained. So for the people who care about this workload, it really wouldn't matter. 
probably. Um, it would have to be dramatic. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that this particular code base has been using the copy on write string for years. We've been running profilers against it for years. We've been think there have been cases where we've intentionally changed code in order to preserve sharing across data structures. So we haven't given that kind of love to the small string optimized strings in this code base. But nonetheless, someone has to pay for this one way or, or another. We have to either eat the heap or we have to figure out some, we have to rework the code to save the heap. So the reality is I have to pay some amount of energy to solve this problem before we can switch to small string optimized strings in some of our workloads. Um, so, but I have some limits. <laughs> but the question is, and the inspiration is, can I get something out of this pain? Um, I could just ask for more RAM, but maybe I can preserve sharing. I know that some of the studies that, that gave sharing a bad rap used earlier processors that had more expensive atomic ops. Since Nehalem, which actually is pretty long ago, atomic ops became much less expensive. I saw this in other, in other workloads not related to strings at VMware. So it may be that the atomic ops related to sharing are not as expensive as we think. Um, and we have attempted to profile them and have not had them show up. Again, not for strings, but for other things, for other reference counting. And there's no reason to believe the string reference counting wouldn't have shown up in the same, in the same measurements. Um, so the question I have is, can I buy or build a library solution? Um, so that's the first inspiration. The cow is dead. The second inspiration is string view. This is more of an opportunity than, um, than a problem to solve. But just to review, string view has this view into a heap. Um, and here I've been able to tweeze the word win out of twine. Um, and in our code base, it has limited use to date. We don't have, we have a few primitives that are like string view that we could drop string view in to replace but most of the code base is not using this. So what that means is when we start using it, like has been done in the standard library, it's going to ripple virally throughout our code base. So thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines will change eventually. Um, so as long as we're changing everything, maybe this is actually an opportunity to change everything. This is the second inspiration. Uh, and part of the inspiration also comes from this talk at CppCon last September, uh, where Nicholas was showing that this is the layout of the GCC uh, small string optimized string. And you'll notice there's a data word up front and then a size word. Um, and I just rejiggered my thing to have the same layout. And I looked at that and I said, I looked at Nicholas's slide and I said, hey, there's a string view right there on that slide. Did you see that? There's a string view right there. Like, there's a string view right there. Like, you can just slice that sucker to a string view, and wouldn't that be cool? Um, and then that totally meshed with Chandler's talk, where he was talking about all the optimized data structures inside LLVM, where they actually do this trick of slicing the data structure to do, do some type erasure, essentially, um, as part of those optimizations. And then I looked in the GCC headers, and yeah, no. Uh, they, they, you can, <laughs> oh well. But, yes, go ahead, Marshall. I was say, there's a reason that, uh, that you can implicitly convert from a string to a string view. We don't make it explicit. It's because it's really, really cheap. Yes. Now, I, I mean, and a good compiler will make this go away. As Marshall's pointing out, this should be really cheap no matter what. And it's true. But the, the, the inspiration that's here is that layout might matter. And we should be thinking about layout. And the other part of it is really that, so I have this SSO string that's coming that has some layout. I have string view that's coming. I have the copy on write string that I have right now. And maybe I want to keep part of it at least. And if we sort of uh, put our C++ goggles on, we can even take a C string and wrap it in a struct. And when you look at these things, there's this layout um, sympathy between all of these. They all have some pointer to data, variable length data. They all have some way of getting at the size of that uh, variable length data. Sometimes it's going to be indirect. So this is really the, the second inspiration. There's this set of types that are related. And again, why now? Well, it's not just these two things, but there's a bunch of other stuff going on in the industry. 
We have const expert, which means that we're learning how to use strings at compile time. Uh, and I think that's a really important part of understanding how strings work or will work in the future. As has been said, you know, we have UTF-8, like end of story, we're done, right? Uh, things have changed a lot since C++ 98. Uh, Unicode is now on revision 8, I was kind of surprised to see. Um, and it's definitely, my workloads all basically assume UTF-8. Um, and, uh, and I think that it's pretty clear that Unicode is the way we want to organize um, encodings. Uh, so that has given us a, a better way to think about strings. Also, we're really very much in the, in the world of 64-bit addressing. Most of the phones in the room have 64-bit chips, if not this year, then next year. Um, and, you know, the, we can think about things in terms of 64-bit, and really, it's probably, I suspect it's not going to change for a while. Uh, and that makes a difference in terms of this layout and how we think about pointers and strings. Um, also, of course, we have... Um, Alistair is going to be talking about STL2 and concepts and what does that mean, and it definitely changes the way we think about strings in the future. And of course, we're, there's also a, a, a working group on reflection and metaprogramming, and those guys talk about strings all the time, especially Louis over there, I know. He's always wondering how we're going to make that beautiful, um, and we will. Um, so there's a lot of thinking about strings, and I think... Well, I'm not necessarily looking at the, the, run the compile time and reflection and metaprogramming problems. The solutions that we have at runtime, we want those to work at, in the compile time and reflection worlds as well. We want it to look the same if we can. Um, so I'm not alone, of course. Later today, there's a talk about strings at 4.30 and Beth is. So you know, if you're interested, go and see Barbara and Ansel talk about a new string class. Um, Obviously, uh, QString has been around forever. Facebook had their own string for a while, and they're slowly trying to move to SSO strings. Somewhat, I think, I intuit the same process that I'm going through. Um, uh, Eric Niebler gave us fixed string in December, which is this cool const expert string. Um, and the QT folks have also recently landed a QT string view. So there's a lot of work going on in this area. Um, and the standard, you know, the standard had this thing called code convert, which was deprecated in Kona a few months ago, you know, justifiably. Um, there are proposals up um, for the committee on how to iterate over um, UTF, uh, over character, over character, actually, I guess this is over code points at this point. Um, and there's also uh, a proposal that was presented in Asakwa with quote unquote lukewarm feedback on um, adding a char 8T. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in the talk. But the point is, there's active work in this area. There's a, it's a new landscape in terms of strings. So that's why now. So the next section is basically me looking back at my notes I, have a, I actually have a wiki page where I, every time I find something weird about string that someone has a problem with or there's a bug, I just write a little note. So I went through that wiki, which was sort of indecipherable after all the years, and tried to distill, like extract the interesting problems out of that. Um, so that's what the next section's about. Um, the code base that, that I work in most of the time, it started as a Greenfield uh, C++ project back in the day, and they had the decision to use standard string everywhere, which was actually a really great thing. It made it really easy to blow out tons of code, um, and it solved a lot of questions. There, the answers were there. They might have they been a little bit funny, but they, they were there and they were decided, so it was easy to move quickly. However, as, a, as the code base and the product matures, you start to do more uh, optimization, and more measurements, and you find that it really does have a significant measurable overhead in certain cases. So what are we doing now? Actually, we're kind of, in some sense, refactoring strings everywhere. Uh, so one of, for example, one of the things we're doing uh, is, uh, is changing constants. Now, here's a, a static constant string, which a lot of people would say is a complete no-no, but remember, that was the answer. 
Uh, so we have a lot of those. Well, maybe not so many of them. A lot of them turn into this, right? So this is, this is useful because it removes all the static detours and detours, gets rid of the initialization order issues. Um, and, actually, and actually, one of the things that we can measure and that is convincing for some of my colleagues is that there's actually, you may not see it there, there's an indirection removed. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't, uh, you can, you, you lose indirect, you remove an indirection, the actual, the instruction will have one less indirection in it and generate smaller code. One less instruction, it's important. Uh, so, yes, Marshall. Yes, um, for C++ 17, I would probably write that const x for str string view k name equals right. S S so, so Marshall's Mo Marshall's describing well, Marshall's describing the slide that in about two slides okay. that he's saying use string view. So. Uh, uh, so one of the things we have to do is we have to think about constants. But so now we have a constant that looks like this, and we have our old function that was written back in the day that takes that happily takes const, uh, const string reference, and of course this co this code compiles until your profiler finds it because it's generating a temporary, uh, and so we definitely find these everywhere. So what do you do? Well, so we change the signature of the function to use a const char star. Oh boy, um, because that that always worked in the past, so it should still work now. And you know, this of course is is horrible, and in some ways because it's viral, it it pr starts propagating everywhere. Um, and uh, it we have to often we end up adding overloads for both forms. And you know we end up having to call Sterlan in some cases, where we didn't have to do that before. And of course, when we're using the sharing, it breaks our sharing. So this is not very pleasant either. So we have this now. We can use now we can use string view as a parameter type, which is great, um, and it solves a couple of the issues. It's still going to be viral throughout the code base, and this is what I was talking about before. And it's still going to break copy on write sharing, or break sharing. But it will avoid the calls to Sterlin. It kind of gives us one thing instead of two things to use. So we should have fewer overloads. So when we think about strings, I, I need a solution for parameters. And string view is good, but maybe there's something more, there's something different to use. Uh, so of course, you know, what happens when you, you get a, a a Java or a, C++ or a Python programmer and you give them C++, they write stuff that looks like this, um, which is a bunch of binary ads of strings, works beautifully, malloc's freely. Uh, and no matter what, even with our value references and moves, this is gonna generate an extra malloc that just didn't need to be there. So of course, we solve these kinds of problems with, um, and of course our profilers find these too. Uh, we've, we've solved these kind of problems with builders, the simplest builder is a concatenator that just pre-computes the length and reserves. Uh, so this is pretty straightforward. But of course, we also have type safe uh, formatters. Uh, these are great. Everyone should have one. <laughs> uh, they, they make a lot of that code go away as well, and they can pre-calculate the length. So builders are something that I need when working with strings. Um, and finally, obviously, I also need values. So when we think about strings, it's, there's actually several, not only are there are multiple types coming up, but there's actually several, multiple use cases for types. And some types may be useful in, in both use cases. Like, for example, uh, string view might be useful as constant, and it might also be use, useful as a parameter. But, So the next thing that comes up out of my notes is talking about locality. Actually, some of the code was written on Windows and so used the small string optimized string from the beginning and actually kind of kept that in mind in designing the, the system. And when you look at those kinds of classes, what you see is you might have a V table up front of the, of the class instance. 
you might have a reference count. And then immediately after that, you might have some heavily used string. And this is great because that means that all of this data that gets used millions and billions of times is all on the same cache line for the object. So it, when you look at strings this way, through the lens of a small string optimized string, having a string identifier is cheap. It's just a couple more words in the cache line. And of course, then you have the rest of your member data after that. So locality. Sometimes we need strings with high lo that, are, that provide this locality. But of course, sometimes we have lots and lots of instances of the same string and we need sharing. That's pretty obvious. So these two are kind of <clears throat> yin and yang. There are cases when you need both, or you need one and cases when you need the other. And then there's this thing about sharing, which I call mutable cow disease. So that is this bug. This is a suspended bug in GCC, STL, so, and it's an actual bug. It's possible to, to uh, cause it to come into being. It's a race. Uh, and as Jonathan Wakely said, we're not going to do anything about this because SSO strings are coming, so we're not going to fix the cow string. Now, we have actually been living with this for a long, long time, and every time we see data corruption around strings, we're all like, oh, it must be this. And every time, no, it's something much simpler somewhere else. So this one is actually kind of hard to hit. I don't know if anyone in the room has actually ever hit it. Um, actually, just the other day, I had a friend say, ah, I hit this bug. Have you ever hit this bug? And I was like, no, you probably didn't hit this bug <laughs> based, on, based on prior experience. But nonetheless, this is a bug, and this is a problem. And really, not this particular bug that's important. What's important is that that copy and write string implementation has extra complexity in it in order to be mutable. That's the key bit. So, and it's that extra complexity that has the bug. So the, the, the bug arises when you're, you have a mutable reference to a, to a string, and you use it in a way that looks surprisingly like it's const, but it's not. Um, so the other piece is sharing and immutability kind of go together. We want, these, we want these two things. We probably only need sharing with immutability. We can leave the, cow, the dead cow disease behind. So the next thing to think about is the, uh, is size, the actual size of the instance, uh, the string instance itself. We have, we have our own optional template, not surprisingly. It looks like a bool with a value next to it. Uh, and in the case of copy on write strings, that value is just a pointer uh, with a heap block attached to it. And when the, when the optional is unset, the overhead is a pointer. But if you look at a small string optimized string, the overhead is significantly bigger for that unset optional. And the type signature of optional is that it return, when set, it returns a reference to a standard string. So I have to have, I can't fake it. I have to have a reference to a standard string somewhere, and they're big. So this actually was a problem that at, in some workloads, actually relatively long ago, caused us to run out of memory. Uh, and we solved it, however, by instead of, taking, instead of holding a string by value, hold a pointer to a string. And then, of course, if the pointer is null, then the string is null, then the optional is, is unset. But of course, this means that we keep the instance out on the heap, and then that keeps some string way off somewhere else on the heap. So we have this linked list locality uh, problem with, with, with this implementation. So the key point is that, uh, oh, so we care about the size of the instance of the, the string. Another place where we care about the size of the instance of the string is if we have lots of strings that are from fun some finite set. So in these cases, we have done, uh, we have, we've done work where we uh, collapse the set into shorts, short keys, for example. So now we can pack, pack many, many more of these into cache lines. Uh, so the size of the instance of a string actually does matter, and we've done work to reduce that size for various reasons. Um, so size of the instance variable. There's one more thing that I want to mention here um, that's sort of inspired by this optional case 
the optional, this is again with the copy on write optional, so the smaller one, but it's not as small as it looks because that bool, depending, if you put the bool after the pointer, you, you pad a little bit less, but that bool is gonna have some padding around it. So this is actually, there's actually, the, even the pointer is significant overhead in the unset case. And if you look at this, and you know a little bit about the implementation of the string, you'll, you'll know that actually that pointer inside the copy on write string will never be set to null because of the implementation that GCC uses. So what we can do is we can steal, we can bit steal from the, the string and we can do this. That's an unset optional string. Uh, and this actually, this is actually has a measurable effect. So this, in, in, a, in the same workload where I was measuring the ABI change, this actually reduced the heat bite, the startup heat bites by 1.3%. Not, not a, um, nothing like the 20% uh, uh, regression that I saw with the ABI change, but 1% but heap size reduction is a good day normally in my world. So that, that's, a, that's an interesting number. Of course, one of my colleagues said, well, we obviously have too many unset optionals. We should solve that problem first. Um, and he's probably right. But, <laughs> but the point is that this string implementation has extra bits in it that it's not using. And we could use that for nullability. And strings are arrays, and arrays have a sort of uh, null duality is inherent to, that, to them, if you think about type systems. So that you want a nullable string seems likely, and that your, if your string contains a pointer, the, there's very likely an invalid pointer value that you can use, um, or some other place where there's a bit that you can use to indicate a null state. So this is, uh, I think, something that's worth thinking about. That's nullability. So that's the last, uh, the, the, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more. Thank you, Outlook. Second to last. The last thing that I want to talk about is encodings. Uh, and I, I don't claim to be a Unicode expert, uh, and, and I actually used to work on internationalization a long, long time ago, but I've forgotten all of that. Um, but we do, the way that we've hit encoding problems is this bug. We have a lot of RPC servers that often are encoding their messages in XML. Some innocent client will send a message to a server. That server will send back garbage. At which point the client, what does the client do? I can't decode what you gave me. I give up. I can't talk to you at all, basically, is often the effect. You're sending me corrupt data. You're broken. And so you go to the server side and you start debugging this and you, well, you look at the RPC library. Nope, that's not the problem. And you look at the application logic and that doesn't, that's not generating the garbage. And then you actually, the application is calling into the kernel and the kernel is calling to a driver and some guy is just giving us garbage back. And the problem with this scenario is that it's discovered over here. This is the very bad place to discover it. So what we were able to do pretty easily was to make this, make the RPC library smart. I won't, not only will I not serialize bad data, but I won't let you fill out my, um, my emitted data types, uh, my RPC data types. I won't let you fill them out with non-valid UTF-8. But, but the RPC library still has its hands tied Pretty much all it can do is say, hey, the server doesn't know what it's doing. Here's that HTTP 500, which is better, much better, but still not a, not a great way to handle the problem. So uh, really what we want is we want the, the encoding checks val validation to move down into the application logic. And they're, they're the people that are going to be able to say, oh, that was in a Korean encoding, and there you go. I can switch that into UTF-8 for you, no problem. It's probably not the domain of the kernel. It's probably, honestly, not the domain of the driver. This is really application logic, and the application logic is using standard string everywhere. Yes, Marshall. So I'm, I'm afraid I'm not understanding where the source of the problem is. Is the problem that the client is handing you stuff that it claims is UTF-8 but isn't really, or is there a bug 
No, no. Server where it's it's generating stuff and not not tagging it with the correct encoding. Or so Marshall wants to know where the 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 origin of the problem is, and the the origin the the root cause is that the application is querying a driver. That driver is returning non-UTF data, okay. and and as it should basically. As it's allowed, you know, it's being reasonable. It, it, you should know what the device is, and you should know how to use it. The application logic is making the assumption that that's UTF-8. Okay. And you know, this is an easy mistake for an engineer to make. Um, but we really, but so from my point of view, I don't think I convince can can convince all root sources of character data to use a particular encoding. That seems impractical. But the next best step, I mean, I'm currently at this state. I can control the RPC library. I can kind of reach into the application logic a little bit that way. But the application logic quickly switches over to, to standard string, and I lose them. And, and, and then there's a, potentially a fairly long chain of, of um, data flow mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, that's all in standard string. Okay. So, the, so where, where I... What I think would be helpful would be to have a validating, to do encoding validation much, much earlier in the application logic. Basically, that system call that's returning that string is probably being assigned to a standard string, and it should, it should, uh, it should complain at that point. Like, you, this doesn't, you didn't, you didn't transcode this, so please do that. Yes, I'm sorry, Arthur? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's that. So, Mar so Arthur's point is, you kind of want to have one vocabulary type through the whole stack, and you want to be able to to uh, use that transparently within your stack. And and I agree. And the problem is that standard string doesn't give me that today. Doesn't enforce that. Standard, standard string doesn't know anything about your code. Right. Well, it, it, yeah. <laughs> There's some more on this later. Uh, so encoding. So now we're at the end of the. So these were the. Those were basically the highlights of my notes about bugs and uh, to performance tuning, uh, education problems that I ran into with strings over the years. So the next the next step is to to try to condense that and rethink and put it in a better structure. But this, this is also kind of a good intermission if you have questions and I can have a glass of water. Uh, yes, Joe. Are you planning on talking about custom allocators with strings or ah. experience with them and how that plays into your other issues? Uh, the, yeah, the, uh, um, Joe asked uh, whether or not I was going to uh, be talking about custom allocators, and the answer is no. Uh, the, the closest I get is that table example, and I'm pretty much done talking about that. So this is where I start to, now I'm not based on fact anymore, I'm based on the way thinking about things. So I have a lot of questions here. Um, if you think I'm wrong, you know, you're probably right, at least as right as I am. So I want to, somewhat to Joe's question, I want to explain my mindset and also to, um, uh, also, uh, to the question about 64-bit uh, um, addressing earlier. So I, I am looking at this from the point of view of uh, trying to make C++ a zero-cost language. Often uh, changes are motivated by a measurement, whether it's code size, code complexity in some ways, or execution performance or uh, heat performance. So really, often the metric is what's driving the decision, and I will tend to gravitate to zero cost. Uh, and it's driven by my particular workloads and metrics, which are mostly uh, middleware. Uh, and I'm definitely thinking only about 64-bit addressing. I am definitely thinking that we should be using more Unicode, we should be using it more strictly than we are. 
Um, I'm not necessarily thinking about standards track stuff. I think that's way too hard for the places I'm going. Uh, I'm not at this point worried about all the find first not of and find last of and all of these operations on strings. These are not interesting to this talk. Uh, and I'm also not particularly thinking about compile time metaprogramming, as I mentioned before. Though obviously I want, I want whatever idioms we have to work in that environment as well, and I want to take advantage of that when, when it arrives. Uh, and also I, someone in a practice talk asked a question about unloading, <laughs> unloading static strings, and I said, no, I'm not interested in that. I don't do that. And uh, I can assume that static memory really has pro process lifetime. So also part of the mindset is failure is an option here. I don't have to do anything new. I can't, the default is to just use standard string and string view and virally use those to the best of their abilities. Eat the heap um, increase, optimize for SSO instead of for copy on write. This is the most likely course of action, I would say, actually. But I have some time to think about alternate courses of action. So again, these are the things we're thinking about. But I actually want to rephrase them in terms of uh, what I'm calling traits. And the first one is talking about the data. So every string has data, has some variable list of data. And that data has some size. So the first part is to talk about what is data. Well, um, oh, and then also we'll be talking about ownership, which I'm coupling with mutability here. So shared data is always immutable. And we'll be talking about storage duration, and we'll talk a little bit about nullability as well. So starting off with data, what is data? Well, data is char star, right? That's what it is in, in C and C++ up to now. But really what that char is, is it's a code unit in, Uni in Unicode terminology. And multiple code units make up a code point. And a code point indicates a character. Multiple code points can actually indicate the same character. But these are, this is really the terminology we should be using. So the question is, I actually have a pointer to code units. And that's the level at which I'm thinking about strings. I'm not thinking about the code points. I'm just thinking about the code units. And that's pretty much what we're all used to talking about. That's char star. Um, so code units. What type can I use for code units? I can use char, which uses the execution character uh, uh, encoding. Or I could use wchar, which uses the execution-wide encoding. Or I could use char 16t, which is great, actually because this actually finally says it's Unicode. So that would be wonderful, except that it would make my heat problem even worse. Uh, so I can't necessarily use that. Char 32T also useful because it is known to be Unicode, but again, not useful as a replacement for what is char star today. And so I can also as someone said earlier, I can also declare that char is UTF-8 throughout my process. And, and this is what we do, essentially. But there's a problem with this, and it's pointed out in, um, in Tom, Tom Honerman's um, paper, which I'll reference again in a minute. And that is that these two types are, you, you can't distinguish between these two types. You can't overload on them. If you have a char star, you have something from a driver, or you have UTF-8. You just don't know from a library point of view. So is, is, um, yes. is the U8 string currently still based on? Yes. It's not based on an octet, yeah, per Yes, that's correct. So the, the, the standard has only two types that say they're Unicode encoded, and, they, and neither of them is 8-bit. Two, two, code, two code unit types. Are yeah, there. right, two code unit types. Right. Is, is it going to be that? Uh, well, with 17, we get, uh, no, not with 17. Okay. <laughs> so, so this <coughs> until... until the committee approves it, which uh, I, I talked to Tom earlier this week, and it, uh, his quote was, "This got lukewarm feedback at Is Isakwa, and it, he's going to be he's going to be in Toronto, and he I think he'll be talking about this, so maybe it will make some progress there. To me, 
there, I mean, the, I think the committee has concerns about the heritage of char, and it's probably justified. From my point of view and my application workloads, this would be useful. Um, however, it's not the complete story. Yes, go ahead. So I wrote the original chart for key paper, and um, the, the feedback from the committee and from ah. talking to other people has always been, well, you're just using UTF-8 everywhere. Char is already UTF-8. You're fine. Right. Okay. So the but question, I, the, I, the I statement. The statement from the audience was, I wrote the original R, uh, RFC for char AT, and the feedback from the committee was, just use char A, just use char and decide UTF-8 everywhere. And yeah, that's unsatisfactory for my workload. Um, do you have another question? No, just doing some searching. So, but, you know, I got, I got, got a little a little lost in the in the Unicode uh, standard stuff once you get started. There's quite a lot of fun stuff in there. And one of the things that you see is that actually Unicode has multiple encodings within Unicode itself, right? So there's these things called private use areas and they're specifically designed for people that want to use have their own encoding where most of the code points are defined by Unicode but there's still thousands and thousands they can use by themselves for their own purposes. And so if I were to think a little bit more broadly and play in that world, I actually need something that's some kind of opaque code unit type for an encoding, not just char AT even. But this is maybe more broadly than I need to, I can be a little bit more pragmatic than that, I think. But technically we actually need something like this. So why not just char? And we've talked about this a bunch. Well, and just say the execution environment is UTF-8. And my answer to that is, well, actually, the encoding we use is WTF-8, <laughs> which is what they found in 8 bits. Um, that's the reality. Yeah. Uh, it, might be, it might be EBCDIC. Right. <laughs> right, 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 right. This, the committee also has to, to, to work with EBCDIC. That's right. Are you referring to the actual WTF-8 encoding? No. Because there actually is a real WTF-8. OK. <laughs> Another lesson from the audience. Don't use that. Uh, there is actually a real WTF-8 encoding. Awesome. <laughs> uh, and obviously, char 16T doesn't really work. Uh, there's way too many things that assume single byte um, code units. Well, uh, you know, I think it works. I think it work. I think it works on Windows. Um, it's just not clear that it. Mac OS, iOS. Yeah. So now those two. Well, in my workloads, not compelling yet. Maybe, maybe someday. It's a. Uh... Marshall pointed out that iOS and uh, Mac OS also uh, have char sixteen T. Environments, so I think that's valid. I think, and I think that that's actually useful, uh, useful feedback. Maybe this is the way to go. It's not in the short term, though. Yes, Arthur. Uh, well, I think the counter argument to that is that uh, that idea of I need to interface with Windows, I need to interface with iOS. Like that's exactly the, the driver example from your original slide. Like, so you have some low level interface that has a weird encoding, so you need to be able to convert to. Right, so Arthur's point was the platform, maybe it's the platform encoding shouldn't drive the, this, the systems encodings necessarily, or the way that you write your portable code. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not gonna say that, uh, that Microsoft and iOS have made a bad decision here. Uh, it's just, yeah, yeah. So maybe maybe that's the way. Maybe this is the way to go. Maybe this is the way to solve this problem for me. If you look at the Swift, Swift encoding is UTF-8. So it may well be that Apple is shifting from from UTF-16 to UTF-8. Okay. So Charles is pointing out that Swift is UTF-8. And Linux is UTF something throughout. Yeah, yeah. UTF something. Yeah. yeah. It, it's and it's and UTF and Rust is UTF-8 as well, yeah, but. Code. Yeah, so I certainly come from the UTF-8 rich world, I guess. That, that's my worldview, but. Um, 
you know, Chari tea, will I get it? I don't know. Um, should I be using something like um, Jonathan's type safe library to create that, that opaque byte? Uh, and he's talking about that later this week. Another plug for another session, C++ now. Um, I don't know. I think my perspective is for now, this is not a easily solvable problem and I will continue to use the char is UTF-8 unless it isn't uh, idiom. Um, at least for the code unit. I think I can do more at the string, but the code unit itself, I, I don't think I have a, enough of a handhold on. So if I think about strings and data, there's some function that takes a, a, a string and gives me back an encoding and a code unit. Um, and also there's some function that takes the type of a string and gives me an encoding. Um, I'm sorry, the first thing is there's some, there's some function that gives me a bunch of code units, a pointer to a bunch of code units. Then there's another function that gives me an encoding type from a string type. And maybe someday I'll have it where I can get um, an encoding type from a code unit type. So data size. Um, and I hear I'm going to be very opinionated. Uh, I, I definitely would, I'm interested in the possibility of using sign types for size. So if I had, if I were rewriting the world, um, I would be interested in, in having a sign type for, for string data. Can you motivate that? I, yeah, so the question is, what's the motivation? For me, the motivation is that I see a lot of code that does arithmetic uh, work with with position with string positions, and that and most of those expressions uh, should be using signed math because an overlook because an overflow in those expressions would be undefined behavior, so they shouldn't be expressed with modulo arithmetic. So should we instead ask for unsigned? I think that would, I, my guess is that I would, that would not help my users, but I haven't tried it. I, I think that there's a lot of negative values in those expressions that, that are useful and make sense. And what do you, I guess, some clarification, what do you mean by data size? Do you mean of the, of the string object itself, do you want to go from a, a, a size t to a pointer to? I have a pointer, I have a pointer to code units, how many? That's the size that we're talking about here. I know I've used size differently before. Yeah. Data length. That's why it says data size. I didn't want to use, <laughs> there's a, the terms are overloaded. The problem is length right. in strings. Length probably should be code unit, I mean code points, right. not code units. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get the, the <laughs> I can't use length. Whether you're, you're talking about the containerness of the string. No, I'm not talking, here I'm talking about that, that pointer to code units. Okay. Um, and so here's another opinionated thing. I think this could be int, a uh, 32-bit int, actually. I don't think we have a need to allocate large contiguous memory for string data. Uh, uh, and... Do <laughs> you need to talk to the Google folks about that? Well, it, should it be in standard string? And I, 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 for my workloads, that's definitely not happening. Because I have some workloads that still, well, actually, that can still run, don't still run, but can still run 32 bits. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that certainly isn't happening there. And it's a trade off of do you want the ability to have four gigabyte strings or do you want 50% of your own hash value? Right? Because those are two different strings the size of your strings by half. Well, there, there are. Well, yeah, there's a the, there's a lot of overhead is associated with that length. I mean, there's there's going to be other overhead associated with that length. It's a it's an it's not half this many. There are evil people out there who are storing C string arrays in standard string. Sure, that's that's a way to blow through it fast. If you want to. So I think there's a so my motivation is I don't think I need it in the workloads that I have. Um, but obviously that's not going to work for everyone. Another motivation is that I want to have some bits left over in the 64-bit register for other things. That's the other motivation. 
And uh, the other thing is that data size can actually be part of the type. You can have a static size. Um, and the data size can be dynamic, uh, meaning we have to store it somewhere in the string structure. Um, and th these, two, these two things are actually captured by this um, paper, which is advancing in the standards committee about standard span, which is a vocabulary type for uh, spans. And it has a notion of um, uh, a static length for spans, which is, I, I think, reasonable to, uh, a reasonable starting point here. Uh, and also we can have the length be, null, be determined by null termination. So there's, given a string, there's some function that gives you a size. Um, and also given a type, a string type, there's some function that gives you a size maybe. This is the way the span works. It gives you this negative one if the type doesn't know how big it is. But it can also give you a positive number when it does. Um, the next thing, the next piece is ownership. So we can obviously have view ownership, uh, like string view. Uh, we can have shared ownership, uh, like my coffee on write strings. And we can have unique ownership, like uh, small string optimized strings. Uh, now, and the, the ownership and mutability are intimately twine, intertwined, at least from my point of view, or I'm simplifying things. You can think of other mixes, uh, but I don't think it's that useful. So from my point of view, shared should always be immutable, a view should always be immutable, and the unique owner case is the mutable case. So um, given some string type, probably we just need to know whether or not the string is mutable or not, maybe. I'm not clear about that. Uh, and the other thing about ownership is that I think we should think about ownership transfer between types. So one of the things that really paid off in C++11 was move semantics for standard string, because now you can return standard string um, and, and not pay copy costs. But, but I'm suggesting there's multiple types out there that might be valid. So we should think about what it would mean to transfer ownership from a unique uh, string to a shared string, in other words, from mutable to immutable. And actually, I should have a bullet that flips these two. You can do, you can, you can also do it the other way around. I wrote the code for that after I wrote the slide. Uh, so, the next thing to think about is uh, storage duration. Uh, so, of course, we can have static storage. So this is where are the code units stored? Uh, they can be stored by the linker. Uh, or they can be stored uh, as an automatic variable, which could be in, it could be in static storage, but it could also be in member data. It could also be allocated on the heap. How does this go down to relate to code units? Because now you're talking about it. Well, remember, I gave up on code units and I'm using char. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, and here's like, here's putting, now, or we can store the code units on the heap. That's pretty, this is pretty straightforward. And, and uh, this is, there's also another kind of, this is where there's a custom allocator, maybe, Joe. You could have a custom allocator for the string tables or sort of like a custom allocator for code units. Uh, again, not something I'm thinking much about at the moment. Um, I don't think we need to like have metaprogramming around what the storage duration is, maybe. I don't know. The last thing is nullability. Uh, so obviously, like string view right now is not nullable, but char, interestingly, is nullable. So we do have a nullable string type already, essentially, with char star. Yes. Marshall. String view with a, with a size of zero probably satisfies you there with a length of zero. I'm pretty sure not. But I, I mean, it's empty, right? There's, there's nothing there. There's no, there's yeah, no there's there's yeah. yeah. String view dot data of a default constructed string view yeah. is, is null. Yeah, that's. It's defined to be null, right? Is it, is it defined to be null? I'm pretty we sure. We had a bunch of discussion about this. We had a bunch of discussion about whether it was okay for implementations to do that. But 
Um, right, really so matter. there's it's enough. It's a non-dereferenceable pointer. There, there's, it's a pointer you can't dereference. I know, but that's not the same thing as null. I know. Uh, so, I, and, and I needed a non-nullable type. I mean, uh, well, I guess I was bringing up this, this conversation. But it, it's vague enough that it's pretty clear I can't do, there's, there's, no, there's not as an obvious bit steal nope. here as there was with the copy on write string. Um, and the way that I've been thinking, the way that I, when I did the optional string optimization, uh, the way that this looks is more or less these functions, which is, is the type nullable? And here's a void star, please write a nullable blob into it. And here's a void star, please tell me if this is a nullable blob. It's not, it's not, there, there's no constructed object there. There's just some data that's laid out such that it will never appear in a constructed object. I don't know if this is the right way to think about it, but that's the way I was thinking about it. It has to be, the pointers have to be aligned, but. Any questions? Yeah, I'm not sure what you're getting at here, but I'll catch you later. Um, I would say that right now, if the minimum needs to take the size of the segment that it has, because otherwise you don't know how far you. It's, it's memory that is aligned to the, the type that is nullable. So the string type is nullable. Right. If it's true, then it knows how to, given a void star that's aligned for the, its alignment, right. Right. it knows how big it is. So why the, not the, 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 take uh, the line storage? <laughs> well, question, why not take S? Like, because it's not a constructed, function. because I would be lying about the, about a, about a constructed, I would be lying from an alias well, point of view about a constructed I, object. I do think actually that this should all be member functions of the string type, and like if it has a tombstone value or a null value. No, well, eh, well, okay, that's definitely. So, um, Okay, so I, I, I concede I don't necessarily, so the argument from the audience was these are values that maybe should be managed by, they should be constructed string instances, but, they're, but it's a state that doesn't represent a string. Whereas I was trying to create uh, uh, some memory that would never be valid for a constructed string in, in instance, which is perhaps the wrong way about, of going about it. Yes, Peter. <clears throat> That's a, uh, a long discussion if you actually uh, uh, need to distinguish an empty string from a non-existing string. That's, is that what you Yeah, mean? that's the goal, yeah. Okay. And I believe that's a wrong perception we got from character pointers. Well, I, I have application, like I have, I have applications that need, that have this concept, need this concept. And but, but then use optional. Yes, exactly. Use optional, but I want optional to take less space than it has to. Well, then that's make, of implementation. make your library provide an optional uh, specialization for your type that does this, because that's the way you say it. Okay, right. So the the point from the audience was make for 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 the libraries that have strings that. Um, have a, a, the ability to represent, have some bits to represent null, um, they can specialize optional. And that works. Um, it means that there's, I don't have flexibility. I have to use stud optional, but maybe that's reasonable. Or your own optional, which you said you have already. Right, but I'm not going to get GCC to specialize my optional. Right. So, but I might get GCC to specialize optional, conceivably. Okay. But I agree that, that, that basically using stud optional is a way to, to satisfy this set, of, um, this set of operations works for me. Yeah. I did, I, again, I'm, I'm not sure, 100% sure of, uh, of how you're trying to do things, but it sounds like you're trying to write a bit pattern to memory and then pretend it's some object. No, I haven't. I placement construct the string. But, bef but I know whether or not it has been placement constructed by asking the string, hey, did, were you placement, were you, did you write a thing here that says you were not placement constructed? I asked the string to write something there. 
I mean, a concrete case of this would be if this were just a regular sort of frame of the size and capacity, mm -hmm. then is null would say, if my size is greater than my capacity, return true, else return false. And write null would write like negative one into the size and zero into the capacity in that case. Yeah, and not leak memory and all that kind of stuff. Oh, all right, all right, whoa! <laughs> It's not a string that you can't call. Well, that's why you made the non-member functions. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, it's it's I'm you know it's optional. It does placement construct, right? So it already did that. It was just a matter of like instead of having the bool off to the side, I just need some pattern that you can help me find in that storage. Yeah. I'd like to make a statement. I get rid of nullable string. Okay, but I want, but I want my one point, but I want my one point three percent storage gain. But again, we have a mechanism for that optional string specialization. All right, fine. I I agree. You're explicitly allowed to do that, so why not do it? Just don't call it no. Call it tombstone. Right, right. But then I, but well, the, yeah. I think my point was I I hacked this into the the STL. No, yeah, you. I could do that too. Oh. You're allowed to do that because it's a user-defined type. You're allowed to specialize standard type, standard library types for your user-defined types. Okay. No, I I think it's all going back to the same thing, which is specializing optional is another way to do this, and and perfectly valid. And I agree. Yeah. So it's better. It is the, the vocabulary way to say it. That's yeah. But in, in your defense, I, say, I, I really like this, and the reason is. <laughs> <laughs> so someone from the audience really likes this. No, I mean, it's, 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 it's on the front. I'm, well, no, it's like it, what okay. you're saying is like you have no other side. Writing to avoid pointers is not the fine. <laughs> <laughs> we should we should probably move on well, because we're at the hour of of ninety minutes, and so we should we should move on. Uh, I thought this talk was going to be too short, but no. <laughs> uh, yes. Are, are you targeting this specifically only at GCC and the rest of the world can deal with it themselves? No, I have to. I have portable code, and it has to go lots of places. The GCC is kind of for me is the lead, um, but you know, like. But but we we do them well. We don't use Intel as a compiler, but we use GCC, MSVC, and and Clang. Right. And the reason I ask is because you and libc, but not libc, <laughs> but not libc plus plus very much, just like a few of us. Yeah. So so what do you do on macOS? Oh, on macOS we use libc plus plus. Okay. Yeah. Just I'm sorry, it, like okay. slipped my mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, fair enough. Uh, yeah, we yeah. So we use all all of the above, the, the those that mixture. Um, so that's the last trait, Peter. Again, just. <laughs> Wait, so All right, this the slide is gone. Idea. Okay. Get rid of bad ideas. All right. Well. <laughs> yeah. Um. So the next part, <clears throat> it will be short. But we'll go through um, a little bit of code. Uh, so again, this is really we're starting with the values. Uh, I haven't I haven't gotten into constants, parameters, and builders. Uh, and and particularly, I wanted to look at mutability and storage duration first. And so I think about these things in kind of this graph. So for example, a constant expert char array is shareable. And immutable, and it has um, automatic storage, uh, essentially. And um, the <clears throat> small string optimized string kind of straddles the automatic storage and dynamic storage. When it's a small string, it uses automatic storage. When it's a larger string, it uses dynamic storage. And it has unique ownership of the data, and it's mutable. And uh, I wanted to point out, like Facebook actually had FB string, which had this shape. It's wonderful. They actually did all three modalities for a while. Um, and for very large strings, they were using um, sh shared immutable, uh, 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 immutable data, dynamic allocation, and then they were using and they were using dynamic unique allocation, and they were also using uh, automatic uh, storage. Um, however, they're, they're, they're basically, as far as I can tell from some changes in that, in that class, they're transitioning to SSO and getting rid of some of that complexity. 
Uh, and I have this, the copy on write string, which is what I, I also have small string optimized strings, but the copy on write string has this dead cow disease problem where it, it, it bridges the immutable and the immutable um, boundaries, which is a bad thing. Uh, and so the way I want to think about it is basically we need to break that into two types, a shared string type and a unique string type. Um, these don't necessarily, the unique string type doesn't necessarily need to use the automatic storage. It could use the heap lock storage, just like the copy on write string. And that would preserve the string instance size, not data length size, uh, string instance size thing that I brought up in the middle, in the, in the beginning of the talk. And we can also think about um, unique strings that have no dynamic allocation. So there's undefined behavior, or there's an assert, or there's an exception. Uh, when the, the, the storage is exceeded. And we can also think about um, immutable strings that have, I mean, the, the const expert char star is basically satisfies that block, but if we want a system of types, we want something that looks a little bit more like um, Eric Niebler's uh, fixed string there as well. And, and, I, and I think as the small string optimized string definitely belongs on, on the page too. Um, and I'm not sure that much else does uh, when you think about this axis. Uh, and so I've been busily fiddling around with, with this kind of code to see what it would look like. And I basically I've got to the point where I have shared and unique working in, uh, in, in, some, in some fashion. So that's what we'll go and we'll take a look at. <clears throat> Can you hold that there for a second? Yeah. You were gonna send these slides off to, uh, to Bryce. To yes, I will, yeah, Thanks. yeah, yeah. Um, just, just for first timers, most, most all the present, presenters will send their slides to Bryce and they'll show up on GitHub. Mm -hmm. There will be links from the videos on YouTube to the slides. Yeah. I'm just thinking about notes coherence. Sure, <laughs> yeah, just, I'm just saying. Yeah. All right, I have to, let me, uh, <coughs> Uh, okay, so this is a um, small library. I'm sorry, I have, let me do this. I have presentation software problems. Okay, now I can actually see what's on the screen. <clears throat> uh, so back to the project page. So this is a very small toy library, um, uh, and um, it is, you know, it's BSD licensed, but there is not a lot there, and um, you might be able to get it to build, but you're totally and completely on your own. Um, I build this in a crazy lib C++ clang cross-compile environment that I have, um, so it, it's not, and there is a CMake system there, but um, I pass huge numbers of arguments to configure it correctly for my, for my environment. And I don't know whether it will work for anyone else. Um, but it is kind of a useful playground. Uh, and just a brief look in there. So it has a shared string and a unique string implementation. Um, they're very skeletal. There's no operations like find or anything like that in there. It's, most, it's focused on storage, storage management. Um, and the key bit here is there's a shared control block that's used for both unique and the shared strings. Uh, and the, the control block, uh, if I go down, there's boilerplate code, blah, blah, blah. Um, the interesting bit is that it, it doesn't actually have the ability to resize the moment, it doesn't have capacity, um, but it does have size. The beginning of the data, which is obviously allocated past the end of the, the, the structure, and an atomic reference count. And this is used by both uh, the shared and the um, the, sh the shared and the and the uh, um, unique string. And then, any questions? No. If you look at the commit history, it's mostly in Aspen. Uh, <laughs> the uh, now I could take a. I think the best way to do this is actually just take a uh, take a quick tour of some unit tests. And the most interesting thing is uh, looking at transferring ownership. So here's a test 
the transfer ownership between a, a shared string and um, uh, and a unique string. So I start um, I start by allocating a shared string, and I check the the heap lock reference count. These are functions defined above for debugging. Heap, the heap lock reference count is one. The total number of control blocks in the heap is one greater than I started with, and then I just I just uh, uh, move construct to a unique string. And um, the number of control blocks stays the same. The, the, shared string, um, the shared string becomes empty, and the unique string um, has the data in it. And um, we can do the same thing. Um, I'm going to show you, test it a little bit. Up. Yep, go ahead. Is there a reason why it becomes empty, not unspecified? Uh, it could become unspecified, but you're, su you're supposed to be able to ask, call functions on it. So size, this is what size returns. You can specify what, it's your class. You yeah, yeah, yeah. What it, what it returns from. So your, it comes down to what, yeah, it comes down to implementation. Like what makes sense in the, what looks efficient in the implementation. And in this case, the efficient thing to do is to uh, transfer control. The size is actually, if you remember, the heat block actually has the size in it. So you, you have no size anymore. So the, in the case of a null control block, the size is zero. So um, we'll go down, look at another test. Bind up minus one. I just, ah, well, that, that, no. Well, so Peter asked, why not minus one? And, um, and I answered, because, and no. The, the reason is that um, you want the default, in this case, you want the default construction of a string of either, of either variety to be fast and cheap. And so the way that I implemented that is just by having a null pointer. And so the default string has to have a length of zero. So this is basically just returning the string to its default state. Minus one is a nonsense answer. If you're going to give an answer, that would be a same answer. Zero. So, so you can iterate over the elements of the string from zero yeah, yeah. to zero. So this is, this is perhaps a more interesting test. That's, that's another thing. Right. Well, so this is the more common case, yeah. which is you use a unique string to build, uh -huh. and then you transfer to shared. Uh, and mm -hmm. the, the case I was using before was I was actually transferring from shared mm -hmm. to move. Now, that case, the, the first case actually shouldn't work if, there, if there's multiple sharing, right? Because that heap block can't be transferred to a unique, to a unique pointer. So this is an example of that. I create one shared string here. And then I create a second um, shared string. And then when I move into a unique string, I actually allocate a new, right. new control block for the unique string at that point. And the, do you have to actually know the, the S in this case? I, yeah. So, uh, I'm, so I'm a little surprised by the fact that S dot size is zero. Yeah, me too. Well, it can't, it can't, it can no longer, well, it could increment the reference. So I agree. This is a, this, this is an implementation decision. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you look yeah, at the. It's, it's an implementation decision that it impacts whether a user is surprised by how your type behaves or not. Right. But the, it turns out that our value references are usually going to go away fast or they've been asked for explicitly with move. Right. So this turns out to not be surprising, yeah. I argue. Anyway, it was a minor point there, okay? Yeah. No, I, in, in this, I am using it as just a test artifact in, in yeah, a yeah. sense. No. Anyway. Thanks. But when you write the code, it's like, well, I could keep the string by incrementing the reference. I could keep it alive by incrementing the ref count, but why should I do any extra work is really what it comes down to. Anyway, um, we're spending time during this session what, to talk about. What I'm missing from that test case is actually that C stays the same. Because don't you miss it? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't the, the semantics of going from, from shared to unique mean that, that there just literally there was only one? Or did you bifurcate the shared? It bifurcated. So it's not really a, it, 
Really it's not really a move. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's really a copy. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's a copy. The thing is, if you had only one, it would have been a move. Then it would have been a move. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I, I think this is actually very much central to the way I'm thinking about things. Right. And the point, yes. and the point about that. checking C was very wrong. Like, so yeah. what is it? That's okay, the, the R rep. Yeah. Yeah. So this this is the case I want. This is the this is the important case that I want to enable. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Get that. Sure. Get, that. get that. I'm. No, I think no. what I'm saying is, I think what the, the people are saying is that <coughs> if you create a unique string from a shared string, and it, and there are multiple ones. Yeah. You're basically you're doing a copy. Yes, you so, are. So you don't really need to destroy the. Yeah. The, the source of. The okay. Code. Well, wait. Hold on. But that could be a post condition of whatever the user is expecting. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't have a problem with that. Moving out of those like, but it always kills the, the right hand side. Because without reading yeah. the source, I, I, I have no problem. So I, I mean, it, it, because we're talking about move, we, we do have sort of the impl implementer's discretion, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think, I don't know if it's all going to fit on the slide, on the screen here. But this is, this is sort of the logic. This is, this is where I ended up, you know, this is not shipping code or any, this is, an, this is a science project. But basically it handles uh, three cases. It handles the case where there's nothing. Okay, fine, just return, return the, 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 the empty pointer. If, if, the, if I, my control block only has a one reference count, well, return my control block. And if my otherwise, create a new control block. And that, that, all, that all makes all kinds of sense to me. Yeah. Um, sure. The only um, the only thing that uh, but look, you are doing additional work. You are yeah. coding the release. Right. The, the and you are line minus two and minus control. three. You can remove. That's that's work you don't have to do. Yeah. yeah. Down down one from the cursor. Yeah. Line eighty five and eighty six. You can just remove. Yeah. yeah eighty six. You can't remove. You have to check one with two reference. Yeah, yeah, I see your point. Yeah, yeah. agreed. And you are, yeah. your argument was that preserving uh, S would have been doing additional work, which is clearly not the case. Moving to S is doing additional work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really Hence, unspecified count. state. <laughs> no, no, that, no, well, hey, so yeah, that gives you an idea of how green this code is, but yeah, that, <laughs> Still, that is, I agree. And this goes back to the the, the test case result, you know, you're, if you take that out, yeah, yeah. your test is going to fail because... Yes, yes, it will, but I can change the test case. You can change the test. Yes, right. excellent. Yeah. Always useful. No, <laughs> you're, you're defining the behavior. Your, your test has to reflect the behavior, uh, behavior you define. If you change the defined behavior, you change your test. And you, you save the atomic operation. It might be yeah, 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 no, definitely. I understand. Uh, yep. This is exactly analogous to shared code or right decision to make for, I assume, ease of use. No, I don't. I, I don't. I don't buy the ease of use. I don't buy the ease of use argument. I definitely was thinking that when I wrote this, but I think it's a bad, bad way to think about it. I, I disagree with your analogy, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I disagree with your comparison. Okay. All destructive moves are bad. There. <laughs> Got, we've gone down a rabbit hole with it. Yeah. Well, that that is pretty much that is the the end of the 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 rabbit hole um, in for the presentation as well. So, questions? Yes. Do you have a less uh, a less test driven motivating example that could be used to explain this to people who don't spend a lot of time? Um, focusing on strings. Mm, uh, so if I can no. take this back to a group and say, all right, we, we want you to use these things we, we're going to call, for lack of anything else, unique strings and shared strings, and here's when and how you would use them. Or is it, at this point, still an exercise to try to get a shape of this? I, I mean, a goal is uh, definitely, so Charles asked, do you have um, something that's easier to understand for someone who's just trying to get stuff done and doesn't care about all these nuts and bolts? Um, to rephrase the question. And the answer is no, not yet, but that's definitely the objective. That's a measure of success. 
I'm basically suggesting that the interface for strings need to be more complicated than one type. And that's not good from a teachability point of view. So if, that, if, if the solution pans out, it has to be teachable. Uh, I will definitely have that problem in spades. I'll get all the emails saying, how am I supposed to use this stuff? So just, just to be, to be evil, um, <laughs> if, we added, if we added yet another template parameter to string that was encoding, would that achieve what you desire? Because it doesn't specify storage, I don't think. Yeah, well, encoding, adding, adding encoding to well, strings. Encoding is, would be, encoding is orthogonal to storage. I mean, so it's so you store it so, these things, and now I'm going to interpret it as I bring it. Out. Yeah, I think Charles is focusing on the the encoding problem. Yeah, so and encoding, and the encoding problem to me is is the big one, like the one with the standard front, which is completely without a console. Yeah, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and I did too. Did you yeah. notice that? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so Marshall the, points out the standard puns, and I just point out, and I concur. I'll give you a reason why, and that's if you I had a, a problem that I was dealing with that I had to interface to Active Directory, and I literally had to go through four different data encoding systems mm -hmm. in order to go from ASCII through um, B strings into UTF-8 strings into wide strings. Yeah, and you're lucky you weren't dealing with file names. That's all. Actually, I was dealing with file names. Oh, well. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, so it, it's a, the encoding thing, as was mentioned, is, is the real big elephant in the room. It, it's it's interesting. I definitely, the encoding ones have generated for me have generated gen, like big pain bugs, like m multiple hours of meetings, not the debugging part. Debugging is actually pretty easy, but the meetings related to the failures and trying to like figure out who was to like blame and to where the encoding should go, the, the correct encoding work should go. Um, so that is definitely big, but it's a very it's a high pain but relatively infrequent problem. And the and the other things where we're changing all the constants and all the method parameters and um, and choosing string view or not string view is actually the active thing where there's active code churn that I would like to get a handle on and direct in a maybe be able to redirect. Go ahead. Um, Another question? Yes. Since, did someone raise a hand over there? Yes. Um, so what, uh, what do you apart from take of arguments if you have different types for storing strings? Um, that is like, that's part of the signed project that I regrettably didn't get to. But I think the answer is there's, de there's a reference, there's a string view. There's definitely a string view in there as an argument. But there is also a need for a parameter type that allows me to um, use shared storage in some way. Uh, and it's probably not shared string. It's probably distinct. Why not? That's my intuition. I don't know yet. It's, <laughs> it's totally. Put it by value so you can pass shared yeah, string by value? Well, because uh, I don't want to pass. Anyways, I'm not sure what the parameter type is that lets me. If I know I need to hold on to. I need to own a string, an immutable string. How do I take advantage of sharing? I don't know what the parameter type is for that quite yet. So I think you might uh, get a lot of flexibility with, with concepts because it would allow you to have an algorithm that only takes strings and they're your strings, but they can be whatever kind of storage string. Um, and that might help a lot. Yeah, yeah. I would say the same thing about concepts, but uh, on a completely related topic, is the recommendation when having a string constant to be inline concept to a string view? And does the inline make sense? Or is it like required to, to make a difference? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Inline is, you know, will help you if you're putting it in a header somewhere. It, it changes the linkage of it, right? Yeah, so. but, but I'm going to go with the comment I was about to make is, is subtly different than that. Is if you're declaring a goal character value, mm -hmm. you know, like your example there, const care star brackets equals two. Right, right, right. Um, much better to say, you know, const x for Peter will want to say auto. I'm going to say string view. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> you have the suffix. Just a second. Yeah, <laughs> just a second. You know, foo equals quote string constant sv. 
Okay, and that all happens at compile time. Yeah, sure. You have no initialization order. It's yeah. a container. You can call begin and end on it. You can get iterators for it. Right. Yeah. So this is the. I think this is the ninety percent case, right. and and um, the the question. Uh, but I do have sort of a question about parameters for. We have a large number of things that might have defaults, which will come out of static storage, <coughs> and dynamic things that are coming in over the wire, and they own. And I'm wondering if I can solve that problem in some way. String, string view is a great parameter choice for the non-owners. Yeah. What I'm going to call pure functions. Yes. Yes. Things yes. That, yes. Things that take things. Don't modify them and don't keep copies of them. Yeah, and those are exactly the places where we've actually built our own little string views is when sure. we have pure functions. They just pay off quickly, yeah. It is required to work in C++ 17. Yeah, I follow other books. Yeah, this just means they haven't done it yet. Yeah, it's exactly. okay. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to use trunk um, LLVM to get that to work, by the way. Yeah. All right, Arthur, did you have, we're out of time, but. Uh, if I'm declaring a global variable of type string view, I should use the, uh, the suffix. That's what I said, SV. SV, yes. Uh, how do I get that again? I put a using permission. <laughs> <laughs> Sing! Uh, that's, that's an awful. C++ 20. That's an awful. Come to one of my talks, uh, or look one of my videos, where I can speak about UDL. And then go read the Google coding standard, which says all suffixes are outlawed. <laughs> all right. I think we're, we're out of time. We should probably wrap up. I, thank you very much for being here and for all the excellent questions and comments.